Good afternoon. I'd like to warmly welcome everyone to this special conversation we're having today on trafficking in the U.S. economy. My name is Dr. Heidi Hofinger. My pronouns are she and her. I am the faculty advisor for the Gender and Sexuality Alliance and a professor of social sciences here at Berkeley College. The GSA was happy to organize this event in collaboration with Student Development and Campus Life and the Division of General Education. I'd like to give a special thank you to James and Sherelle from Student Development and our GSA eboard, Cassie, Andrea, and Alea. We'll hear from Cassie a little bit at the end. She can talk to us about the club. So today's title of the event is Unbroken Chains, the Hidden Role of Traffic Human Trafficking in the American Economy, uh, which is a title of a new book that is hot off the press from Beacon Press. So we are very lucky to be in conversation today with the author of this new book, Melissa Hope Dittmore. Melissa here. Here we are. Hi, Melissa. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to speak with you. We're thrilled to have you. Uh, Melissa is a consultant specializing in the areas of gender, development, health, and human rights. As they relate to marginalized populations of sex workers, migrants, trafficked persons, and people who use drugs. I am honored to call Melissa a colleague and a friend. We have both been working on the issues of trafficking and sex work and drug research for many years. We presented these issues at the UN together. We have even been out in Cambodia doing overlapping research there. Um, so we're very, very excited to, to be in conversation today. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Um, so we're going to have a conversation and then we'll open it up at the end to the audience. Um, and you can just turn your mics on or type them in the chat. So let's jump straight in. Um, so Melissa, when we talk about trafficking, there's often an immediate association with sex trafficking, particularly the sexual exploitation of women and girls. There's also an association of mainstream media, like the films Taken <clears throat> and Sound of Freedom. So we should probably begin with the basics. Uh, what is the actual definition of trafficking? And then I have some follow-up questions from there. Excellent. The definition of trafficking in the US law passed in 2000 involves force, fraud, and coercion in any labor sector. I understand people love the good story of a girl in trouble being rescued, but that's not actually what happens in most people's situations. It's much more likely to find someone who is experiencing force, meaning physical force or coercion in involving threats or threats of force um, or fraud, someone signing a contract for a job that they thought would be a good job that turned out not to be what they anticipated. And that happens a lot. Sometimes it's a job where you think you're gonna be somewhere and have some free time to yourself after you cook and clean for a family. But sometimes that work grows to encompass every waking moment and more. And those are situations that sometimes also involve sexual harassment or sexual violence, including sexual assault or rape, but that might not be the focus. And the focus on prostitution, while trafficking, meaning force, fraud, and coercion can, involve, can be involved in the sex industry. There are definitely trafficking cases in the sex industry, in the sex trades. They are not typical and they're rare. We can get more into that a little bit later because it's been very interesting to me. That's actually how I got into looking at trafficking. And then I went down this rabbit hole, this sort of anti-looking glass world where 
everything I thought, everything I expected was not true. Hmm. Very interesting, a different kind of perspective than we typically hear. So did your research confirm that the sex industry is where all the attention should be focused? And what are the potential consequences of only focusing on sex trafficking when we think about the term human trafficking? In the book, I have chapters about, and I have contemporary chapters and historical chapters. So there are examples of trafficking in agriculture and manufacturing um, in factories and in like garment factories and in food production and domestic work and traveling sales crews. And some of the cases involve people who were born in the States and some involve people who were born elsewhere and came to the US. I focus on the US in this book and I include the background, the legal background, the historical examples. The US is founded on um, getting labor for free in the form of indentured servitude and chattel slavery and prison labor now and continuing today in human trafficking. We're constantly looking for, the US economy is constantly looking for ways to get labor at rates below the market value. And it has been like that ever since we were founded. So can you talk a little bit more about this this hidden role in the economy? I mean, sometimes we don't we don't think about restaurant workers. We don't think about fruit pickers, uh, even people working, you know, in nail salons and places like that. Um, so could you talk a little bit more, I guess, about the specific groups of people that you encountered? Um, you know, a little bit more sure. about the labor sectors. Sure. Um I interviewed people who were trafficked into sex work who were also forced to clean the places where they lived. So there's a lot of overlap. Mm. I spoke to domestic workers who were sexually harassed and agricultural workers who described, and this is heartbreaking, that and that they were definitely trafficked. They were not paid for their work. They were defrauded in that. They signed contracts where they thought they were going to have a better situation and make more than they were paid. But they were also subjected to physical and sexual abuse, so much so that one remote field where they worked on a particular farm, the women were so, they, they knew if they were assigned to that field that they would be raped and that was called the field of panties. It is like, and we're we're missing that. If we focus only on the sex industry, we're really missing all the other people affected. And another aspect about focusing on the sex industry is that people love the story of a girl in trouble. Mm -hmm. But many times law enforcement, particularly, can be much more uncomfortable with boys and men and transgender people and non-binary people who are forced into the sex trades. Some of the examples in my book include someone who was forced, his family sort of split apart in the wake of a violent event. And he was alone at the age of nine or 10 and was sort of, protected, but also exploited by a guy who said, yeah, let's go work in these fields, but who also dressed him in a dress and forced, like he, this child was not forced into anything. I mean, the child was forced to have sex with other people, but the child had no idea what was going on. This is someone who really didn't understand what was going on in the world around them because he'd been so traumatized. And later on, for a lot of people in such situations, they don't have a clear sexual identity because they've been, their sexual expression has been coerced by others and they have never developed their own sexual expression except in response to others, whether it was I was forced to do things or I realized I would have less trouble in life if I went along with something. It is 
very distressing to meet someone who is an adult who's still exploring, not because they haven't had sexual experiences, but because what their experiences were had nothing to do with their own desires. Right. Mm -hmm. there, there are a huge number of layers. And because law enforcement tends to focus in prostitution situations on a cat and mouse game, rather than even if it's called trafficking now, people are still looking for prostitution by women and girls. And trafficking is the only crime for which the victim is routinely arrested. The law enforcement response brings a lot of missed opportunities as well as misfocused resources. I think I'm getting too far ahead, but let's go back to some of your questions, which go more step by step, whereas I just have so much to share. <laughs> Well, no, it's interesting that you mentioned that this is affects all genders, right? That and all ages. Is there a particular demographic in the United States in terms of race or ethnicity as well? Anyone is marginalized for any reason is more likely to be a target. But the first example I include is a woman who was young when she was trafficked and is now after decades of being out of that situation in a very good situation in her life. So I also want people not to think that this victim stage becomes an identity. People move out of it. It's just like other bad situations. If you get out of it, you can move out of it. Um, but you know, anyone who is vulnerable for any reason, whether it is you don't speak the language or you and people will be put into situations in which they're told, well, you have to make a decision right now. Well, or we're going to leave without you and you won't be able to join this traveling sales crew mm. because we're going to go in two hours and you don't really have a lot of time to research. So people will be put into a disadvantaged situation this way mm. or they can be already in a disadvantaged situation by coming here from a place where English is not the dominant language and for whom English, they're not proficient or have very little at all, if any at all. Um, they're people who have arrived with work visas have been put into a more disadvantaged position by their employers not renewing their visas and saying, oh, well, I'll hold on to your passport and I'll renew your visa, but then the visa isn't renewed and suddenly they're out of legal status mm. in the country and they did everything right. Mm. So you have people who are go-getters in their home communities who arrive here with legal status, with a job, but the job turns out to be exploitative. And then the employers don't renew their visa in order to put them in a more vulnerable situation. Sometimes in order to say, well, now you're out of status, I'm gonna call immigration for you to be deported. Right, so it's very coercive, manipulative situations. You speak a little bit about their vulnerabilities, but what are some, what are some of the push-pull factors that cause people to end up in trafficking situations? Oh, some there are many, both. Issues. People leave situations that have been sometimes exacerbated by U.S. foreign policy in other places. If you look at the 50-year history, I would say longer than that, in Central America. Uh, if you look at U.S. agricultural policy that helped remove people from long-held family farms, family and community farms, in favor of corporations owning the land instead of communities owning the land. That has pushed people off their land to move north to our better economy. So you have global political things that people really have no control over. Sometimes this involves international policy, not just from one country, but 
from a world organization like the World Bank or a regional development bank, sometimes implementing austerity policies. And these will make it very difficult for people to feed their families. One joke, one very black humor joke was that the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, when it came to your country, it was the Infant Mortality Fund because healthcare and food programs, food would become more expensive and healthcare would become more expensive. And literally infant mortality rates would go up as in austerity programs were implemented. There's a direct correlation. Mm -hmm. No one will call it causality, but there's a direct correlation and you have to be able to, to see this. But there are other factors as well. For example, the child I spoke about there was one violent event. A number of people in his family died. He was separated from them at the sort of birthday party where murders happened. And he never found them again. So this was in a peacetime situation. But there are other situations involving conflict, conflict situations, wars, um, undeclared wars sometimes definitely lead to situations with people being separated and then having to fend for themselves in ways that they wouldn't if they were still part of a family or a community. But then there are other situations with interpersonal things within families. There are situations in which poverty is a huge issue. You can be in a rich country, you can be poor people in rich countries, as I'm sure many students at Berkeley have seen growing up in the United States. And this can push people to look for better jobs and take jobs that might not be fantastic, like some of the people on the traveling sales crews that I talked to in my book. Um, if there's violence at home, anything might seem better. And that might even be correct. That's definitely a push factor. Violence, poverty, um, and then gender norms also. So part of that is the gender norms of, well, we'd like to rescue a girl in trouble, but if there's a boy in trouble or someone non-binary or a man, who is, what kind of man gets into trouble? Mm -hmm. like, the, there are these gender norms that make no sense mm -hmm. when you're actually you know, anyone can get into a bad situation. Then gender norms about how girls are supposed to behave can make it easier for them to be preyed upon. If a girl is supposed to not be very worldly and stay home and not learn very much about what happens in the world, she can be susceptible. There are examples of this, particularly from isolated communities in my book. Uh, one example comes from a woman, this is a sex trafficking example in which a woman who was very sheltered in an impoverished community in a violent situation at home, left with the first man who showed up into her village and she was just like, it was right out of Tracy Chapman's fast car. And she got into the car and they drove away. And then she was forced to clean. She was forced to sell sex. She was forced to have a child. She was also forced to abort, to have multiple abortions after that. Like every possible horrible thing that could happen to a teenager and woman in their 20s did. She eventually got out of this terrible situation with the help of uh, people in her community, people she worked with in brothels here in New York. And like her colleagues helped her out. Her colleagues were like, don't, don't go wherever you go, come home with me instead. And uh, never come back here, just go somewhere else. Uh, don't come back to this workplace, you will find another. And she was introduced to services. Some people end up in situations where they are, where 
there's a police raid and that's how they leave, but others are helped by someone working in a supermarket, someone working in a brothel, someone who is a customer at the supermarket or the brothel. The, these are human interactions that we don't think about, but they're opportunities. No, I got a little off track with your No, question. not at all. That was actually my next question was how our effort, what efforts are currently in place to combat trafficking um, and help survivors? I know you mentioned a little bit earlier about the current law enforcement approach um, in terms of arresting victims. I know that's a narrative um, and a reality that happens in this, in this, within this issue. Um, so what are your, what's, what is being done to deal with it? And then, you know, what's, what's your ideas on, on those approaches? The best results for people in trafficking situations, um, when they are not arrested by law enforcement, but find their ways to a service organization that helps people who have, with legal services, like you can defend yourself against this crime, you might be able to sue for damages, you might be able to access a T visa. Mm. T is not for trafficking. It was just, you know, they start in the alphabet. There are H visas for agricultural oh, workers and J visas for students. I'm sorry? What What is the T visa then? The T visa is for people who have been trafficked. Sometimes these are, sometimes people will apply for the T visa or the U visa for people who have been abused, people who have been victims of violence, particularly domestic violence. This is usually, this is from the Violence Against Women Act and the T visa is from the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. They were passed together. And so these visas are both available. We've never, 5,000 visas are allocated to people from other countries who have been victims of trafficking in the United States. So 5,000 visas are allocated each year for survivors and we've never reached that mark. We've never come close actually. Why is that? When it, when it seems to be such a prolific issue, it's not being- The visas are really hard to get. Or is it? There are multiple reasons. The visas are really hard to get. So some of it is you have to choose to help a prosecution, which might mean being available for a court case. It might just mean being available to make a deposition, mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily involve going to court. But to say you're willing to prosecute or to cooperate, to say you're willing to be a witness can put people's families in danger in their home countries. It can lead to problems here. There are times when people have legal relationships with people they've been involved with. Like they may be parents together. Like the woman I described who had a child and then was also forced to have abortions she has a legal relationship with the man she testified against as they are both parents of a child that child is still with his father's family and the mom has new children now with a new relationship but She's still very heartbroken over the parenting situation in which she doesn't get to see her first child very much. Mm. Um, but um, the ways that people get out of situations are someone say, often someone saying, here's a person you can call for help, or I know this lawyer who might be able to help you. And these are usually service organizations. The There are some public service announcements or outreach efforts. And sometimes these reach people who they should. And other times they seem more intended to make people who aren't in trafficking situations feel like they're doing something to help others. So there are things that are not effective and things that are. If you're looking for what's effective, look for direct services as opposed to just advocacy and outreach if you're, if something says, talk to your friends about human trafficking, 
That's great if it has a goal, like we'd like, for example, we'd like to advocate for this evidence-based change to the way the anti-trafficking hotline is run such that people get to say whether the police are called. Because when people call the trafficking hotline frequently, the police are informed and the police are not always the best response. The best response is often a social service organization or to offer services without arrest. Mm -hmm. And if you see something that's really just talk to your neighbors about trafficking, that's not outreach or helpful. That if it's actually something where you might be able to reach actual people in a difficult situation. For example, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers in Florida goes to agricultural situation, agricultural, goes to farms and mm -hmm. educates the workers on them about their rights under the law. And workers' rights are for everybody, whether you have a visa, whether you have the right to work in this country, whether you were born here and have a blue passport, workers' rights are for everyone. And the ability not to be forced to work, not to be coerced and not to be defrauded by your place of employment, essentially not to be trafficked, everybody has that right and should be able to access it. And that is what the Coalition of Immokalee Workers in Immokalee, Florida is doing when they go to various farms to say, this is how you, th these are your rights. And if you have trouble, call us. Mm. Do we have any sense of actual numbers and prevalence? You know, there's often huge numbers thrown around about how many people are trafficked in the United States. I, you know, I've, I've certainly seen the number like 300,000 every year people are trafficked. That was an improvement, believe it or not. 300,000 every year was an improvement from the 500,000. But those numbers were based on people who are vulnerable. And that's crazy talk because... People who are vulnerable, every immigrant, every old person, every young person, every person who doesn't have the actual right to work in this country. I mean, you're talking about half the country if you start expanding it to every person who could be trafficked. Oh, so that, and that was the basis of that 500,000 and then 350. More reasonably, the numbers are now in the high teens, like 17 to 20,000. More recently, if you look at the uh, the trafficking in persons reports, the more recent. Now, I haven't looked at the last one, and I. But the numbers had come steadily down after that report started. I think the first one came out in two thousand three or two thousand two, and they That's did not count. include the states at that time they later included the states that came i think in 2009 or 2010 2010 or 2011 because that was not the initial effort how do they calculate the numbers do they get them from support organizations or do they base them on prosecutions yeah i'm just curious um the methodology the has changed from. over time like i said in the beginning it was initially who's vulnerable, which is mm. like, who's vulnerable to measles? If, if you're looking at prevalence or something, this is- It's an interesting criteria to focus on, the potential and not- Right, and are you going to include every young female person if you're focused on sex? And it seemed that that seemed to be part of it at that point. It was quite not very well thought out. Mm -hmm. And now it's a little better. They're extrapolating from numbers that are based on prosecutions. But I don't actually know very much because they don't go into very great detail about how they calculate in the states. But like I said, we've never reached the 5,000 visas in a year. We've gotten over 2,000, mm. but we haven't reached the 5,000 threshold of, okay, then we're out of them. So you mentioned like obviously different geopolitical factors and we've spoken a lot about migrants and migrant experience with trafficking situations. Do we have a domestic problem? I mean, do we, we do have, 
you know, so maybe they're not first generation migrants. You know, we've heard a lot about, for example, black and brown and indigenous girls um, going missing and things like that. What what does our domestic problem look like? When you talk about women of color, missing and murdered women of color, there's a whole lot going on there to unpack. And some of it is racism in enforcement in that there will be a lot more attention to in the both the media and law enforcement to a white girl who is missing and there's there's a great paper about this i think i can't remember the title but it it's like a white girl goes missing and then it tells the story of two people going missing from the same community around the same time and the media attention and the law enforcement focus on finding this white girl and not very much on finding a, a very similar demographically, meaning age and area, location, but very dissimilar being a different race. And I can't remember, I think in the paper, it's a black girl as opposed to a native person, but there's a, or any other person of color. But so there, there are multiple things to unpack there. And there's the impression sometimes that, well, this girl has gone missing because she's run away and we're not going to investigate or she's run away before, so we're not going to investigate or she was involved in difficult things or things we don't want to talk about like exchanging, maybe involved in the sex trades, maybe involved with drugs. And so we won't pay as much attention. The look, looking for an innocent victim or an ideal victim really is an obstacle to addressing people's real life situations. And the ideal traffic victim, like we said, does not include men or non-binary people or boys in the sex trade. And we miss a lot by not addressing some of the issues that make people uncomfortable or make some people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's a lot in your example of, there's a lot to unpack in that. There's race, mm -hmm. there's other issues that overlap, but there's also, what else is going on in people's lives, in people's worlds? What else is happening that, in addition to various norms, what makes some people more likely to have troubles that might make them more vulnerable to human trafficking? For a while, it was homeless people in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So people who were undomiciled, who could get a job in agriculture and uh, just picking vegetables. And sometimes these jobs come with a place to stay, which sounds ideal if you are undomiciled. And then you need a, you might have a place to stay and a job together, but it might be a terrible job. Mm. It might be abusive. Definitely in the case that I use in the book, people were threatened with murder. They described having reason to believe that these threats were possible, that the, that the person who was abusing them could actually carry out threats of murder. Mm -hmm. uh, other situations in, that make people vulnerable in the US Queer kids being pushed away from their families, these are typically the boys and transgender people and some girls who are involved in the sex trades 
before the age of 18, which is a part of the definition of trafficking that I did not discuss at the beginning and I should have, because it's not just force, fraud, or coercion. It's also involvement in the minors being involved in the sex trades. But minors involved in the sex trades are frequently arrested as well. It's still the crime for which the victim is arrested. There's so many, I mean, you describe so many complicated layers, you know, that we often don't think about. And so what needs to happen as a society? What needs to happen in terms of policy changes? What needs to happen in the media? You know, how can we broaden this lens so that we as, as people sort of move beyond just focusing so much on, you know, that super gritty, like sex industry, sex trafficking narrative to really broaden the lens to say, look, this is way bigger than we realize the stuff we're buying, the food we're eating, you know, has likely possibly involved exploitation. So how do we get people, people's attention here, right? So that we're, we're moving beyond taken to, to really understand the depth and the breadth of this problem in the U.S. Moving beyond fictional stories like Taken, mm -hmm. even like Sound of Freedom, which a lot of the people who there have been multiple lawsuits about the movie that came out recently, Sound of Freedom. Really? Um, where the makers of the film are being sued by the people who the characters are based on. I'm going to get a link to an article about that to share because that's actually one that comes up like it used to be taken would be the thing that people yeah. had mistaken for a documentary and now it's sound of freedom which is supposedly based on a true story but it seems that the story I think we have to move beyond the framework of trafficking because with trafficking we focus only on it conjures up the idea of a girl in trouble who needs to be rescued and it it really goes to the knight in shining armor rescue fantasy that anyone looking for the ideal victim is going to be disappointed and if we talk about human rights and workers rights if we expand beyond trafficking, which is at the extreme end, the most extreme example of abuses in the workplace. Mm. If we focus on things before they're that bad, workplace abuses involving wage and hour laws or people just not being paid when they're supposed to be paid, if we focus on these things instead, or in addition, we can prevent trafficking situations by actually implementing worker rights. So what we're seeing now with a hot labor summer last summer and union organizing and other forms of labor action happening, that's actually a huge way to prevent trafficking because the places that could be organized agricultural workers, the UAW, not the UAW, that I mean the United Agricultural Workers. I don't mean the United Auto Workers, although they have been, they were on fire all summer, <laughs> both of them. Oh. These are both areas in which labor organizing will prevent disparities in the workplace that could contribute to even greater problems down the line. As if you, if someone, a management consultant explained to me when I said, well, you know, I was really surprised in these trafficking cases. It's like the person who is abusing people's wage and hour laws is also abusing them for sex. She said, this is exactly the stuff we see in the office. Someone who does not follow the rules in one way or who doesn't respect boundaries in one way doesn't is not going to start respecting them all. It's much more likely that the one person who is a problem on one front will be a problem on others. With trafficking situations, the issue is 
the amount of control people have over the workers. So the workers who are really vulnerable often live on site. Mm. I don't think that we should say no domestic workers can live in, no healthcare workers can live in, but that we have to pay more attention to the rules and enforcing them to prevent gross levels of exploitation that could eventually lead to trafficking situations that could culminate in, in a trafficking situation. Most of the people who describe their situations particularly among the domestic workers, they weren't terrible when they started. Right. And they got gradually worse and worse and worse. Mm. And that is why I think that labor organizing, worker organizing, because not everything is recognized as labor. Farm workers, domestic workers, and sex workers were not included in depression era laws that address labor mm. and the reason farm workers and domestic workers weren't included is that these were traditionally low-wage labor performed by people of color in former slavery states mm. and this was a sop to keep particular states to bring their senators on board to pass these laws in the during the depression. And Very this is why, the, and I have a whole chapter about this. I mean, I start with indentured servants too, right. so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's super important to historicize and contextualize it with that so we can see, you know, see the, the linear trajectory there. Um, we've got about 15 minutes. I have a ton more questions, but I think it's a good time to open it up to the audience, we've got 33 people. Uh, 33, how fantastic. Which is excellent. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I hope that people have sort of burning questions. You've presented a, a very different perspective on trafficking that we're used to. So, you know, I would, I want people to feel comfortable kind of asking and for clarification, any questions, things like that. So we'll open it up. Um, is there anyone who has a burning question? And I don't know, James, if we should unpin or what we should do at this point. Um, yes. If anyone has a question, you do have the chat feature, the q and If you can, you can use the raise hand feature, then I will um, spotlight you so you can ask your question. So whatever method anyone prefers. Any questions about how Melissa did the research or, you know, most interesting findings um, or anything like that? Upcoming research? I, I have a question. I can't figure out how to raise my hand, but I'll, you know, I'll just do it like this. Um, I, I had asked in, in the Q&A um, if you can kind of uh, talk a little bit more on what your thoughts are about the recent, um, you know, the migrants coming over the border and how that's going to affect this um, mm -hmm. whole a lot of people who are coming over the border are definitely vulnerable to trafficking. And there have been, the, the worst situations have involved children. And this has been the case since, since the efforts to separate children from migrant families. Those children were frequently put in custody of people who knew that they were in detention and sought them out specifically knew that they were in immigration detention and sought them out specifically to put them to work in substandard labor conditions. Uh, a suit was just filed last week involving that. I mean, there was a report released about them and there will be lawsuits that follow based on this report, probably some brought by American organizations, but on behalf of some of these migrants, but it definitely, the numbers are increasing for a variety of reasons, but they include push factors like conflicts and world politics. And then the American situation, American politics with migrants being a pawn in national politics shipped to wherever, to communities that have that may have resources to address some, but not the sheer numbers that are arriving 
for example, on buses arriving at Port Authority or planes arriving on Martha's Vineyard, which was those people who landed on Martha's Vineyard were ultimately well, well helped. Mm. But that can't happen all the time if a community is not prepared or if a state is not prepared and the resources aren't there on a national level, they haven't been allocated this way. But I, I'm very concerned about the people I see in my neighborhood. I live downtown in Manhattan and I see the people at the at St. Bridget's Church, the church that is where people go to get tickets to go to a new shelter every 30 days. And a lot of these people are alone. They don't know people here. I worry about them. I I don't have a, an answer to what will happen to them. I see one person asked, Dr. Danielle Sonnenberg asked how we can get involved and help people who are being trafficked. There, there are two ways to get involved and thinking of students and thinking of faculty. Faculty may have more money than time. And if you were going to give to an organization, choose one from the Freedom Network, Freedom mm -hmm. Network USA. I will type that. I can type that for you. Thank you. Because they offer, uh, they all of the members offer direct services. All of the organizational members offer direct services to trafficked persons. The organization itself helps coordinate services and offers training for organizations how to do the T visa applications, how to network with each other, and offer. And they have a great conference every other year in Washington, D.C., and in other times, it's someplace else in the country. So if we want to donate, we should be looking for organizations specifically that provide direct services, not just the ones that do like public service announcements or to spread awareness, right? Right. Awareness raising, if it's not awareness for a specific legislative or policy goal, that's not worth your time and certainly not your money. But if it is an organization that is offering direct services to people, whether it's translation in court or legal services or therapeutic counseling or case management. These are all deeply needed. Um, and be very wary of any organization that involves American law enforcement going overseas. Because these are situations in which they they are often um, implicated in situations like Sound of Freedom, where someone's saying this character based on me is inaccurate, and that situation we were involved in, the movie actually trafficked the children who were involved. We did not do that. I mean, it, if it's all about public relations. That's not actually effective for people who have been victimized in this way. Very helpful. Thank you. We've got a lot of questions coming in here. Illegal adoptions. Yes. I love is this question because Good question is, well, it's very interesting because adoption is not regulated under labor. It's also not regulated under family law. Adoption is regulated under commerce law. Yeah, I bugged out too when I heard that. I was like, wow. Adoption under commerce, the uh, so it depends on whether the person is being a surrogate mom or if this is childbearing for hire. So, but that's the legal definition. If you're actually looking at are there abuses in international and local adoptions, there absolutely are. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, the best person to talk to about them is a woman named Gabrielle Glazer who has, who's working on a film with about adoption and involving women from Guam. Guam has a very high fertility rate and People have been brought here to give birth 
and for their children to be put up for adoption. And this is not a situation that I know terribly much about because I've been focused more on labor, not in the obstetrics and delivery labor, but in workplace labor. Mm. But that, yeah, adoption is governed That's under Congress. That's, That's crazy. That's another presentation. <laughs> in our, yes. But I know um, who should do that. How can we raise awareness about trafficking within our community is a good one, is a really good question. The best way is to work with some of the organizations that are already working with survivors of trafficking. And the, they can include in New York, because I presume most of the people with Berkeley are in the New York area. We're New York and New Jersey, but we also have a lot of remote students, so we, we cover a oh, lot of ground. Okay, then I'm glad I mentioned the Freedom Network because they are around the country. They're, they have a, a large network, national network. If you were in the Southeast, I would suggest talking to Coalition of Immokalee Workers. If you were on the West Coast, the... Coalition Against Slavery and Trafficking is based in Los Angeles, but there are other organizations throughout the West Coast. But the places in the West Coast where things are not being addressed in trafficking situations involve forestry in the Pacific Northwest and lumberjacks. Hmm. Very broad reaching, right? Um, labor, labor abuses happen in every industry. Right. Right. Um, we've got one last question here from the audience by Judy Durish. We can't even help our own people living in poverty. What kind of budget problems is this causing in the states? That's a big oh, question. We only this have is a few an minutes. excellent question. <laughs> I know more about where the budget isn't going than where it is. I mean, I know in New York City, we've cut back on libraries and health care in order to fund the police, I think we could do better balancing. I mean, I feel like 35,000 police officers is double what Los Angeles has. We could probably scale back a bit. Mm -hmm. I would then look at what else is very heavy. I think we should, if we were going to invest, we, we have to build housing and we have to invest in education Where would we take that money from? We can't take it from things like education or sanitation. We need those. Mm. Yeah. I don't know what the city spends money on very much or the government entirely. So bottom line, to deal with trafficking, we really need to look at those structural issues and invest in the structures and, and to prevent those push-pull factors. Is that fair? Absolutely. Great. So um, we've only got about three minutes left. You know, we've got lots more questions, at least I do. Um, but for now, where can we find you moving forward if students want to follow your work? Oh, there is a contact button on my website. I will type that here. And James, I sent you a few of these links. Yep, so Melissa's there. Good. Um, where can we buy your book? Everywhere books are sold. The paperback is coming out in April. So the publisher is Beacon. I'll find the link. Uh, there's you also Amazon there. and Powell's. Thank awesome. you for the congratulations. Oh, there's a, the Amazon link is already up and Beacon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Melissa. This has been fantastic and really lots of food for thought. Um, very, very thought provoking. Um, and so just to finish up here, um, before we say goodbye and thank you to Melissa, I just wanted to give Cassie, who is our GSA president, um, 60 seconds or less to plug the club. Are you there, Cassie? Hi, how are you? Hi. Thank, thank you so you. much for this amazing event. It was really informative and very interesting to learn. There was a lot I didn't know about. 
Um, so thank you so much. Um, so just a quick little information about the Gender and Sexuality Alliance Club. We are a all-inclusive student club, and our mission is to broaden conversation around gender and sexuality. Um, we are actively and always looking for new members of all genders and sexualities. So if anyone wants to join our mailing list, um, I can include Dr. H's email. It is hgh.berkeleycollege.edu. Um, I see James has included our Yammer group um, link. Um, we post all our information there as well. And we always have a GSA meeting every Friday from noon to 1 p.m. I see that James also included that link. So thank you very much. Um, and we have also lots of exciting events coming up. We are doing a table for International Women's Day in New York City on March 8th. And we will also be celebrating Trans Women History in New York City on March 26th. So feel free to join us and stay tuned for all these incredible events and information. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cassie. Nice thank you. shout out to the club. Um, so thank you again, uh, Melissa, for being here and sharing your time with us today and really broadening our horizons, as uh, Judy Durish commented on, really broadening our horizons here and giving us lots to think about um, and things to pay attention to moving forward. So thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me. This was fun, and I'm happy to have future contact. Excellent. So with that, we will conclude this event. Thank you all for coming. And we look forward to continuing the conversation again another day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.